Hi, everybody. My name's Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. You know, we have such an opportunity to be happy. We have such an opportunity to feel blissful, to really know our connectedness, to really know the experience of unconditional love. I mean, there's such a, a momentum now for us as, as humans on this planet. Not humans from one country or another, not humans who are tall, not humans who are a certain color, not humans who are certain smart or certain gifts or certain amounts of money. But we human beings as a collective species, as a, as a glorious experiment in this universe, to feel love and share it, to really come into connection, to really come into contact with who and what we really are. And are we going to take it? Are we going to take it? Are we going to heal ourselves as a species? Are we going to heal this planet? As, as the home of that species? Are we going to come together in creativity and collaboration, in joy and love, in recognition of who and what we really are? You know, really, that's the question now. I mean, the rest of the questions that go on, that are on the TV every day, that are in our newspapers, they pale in comparison to the question of who and what we really are and who and in what ways we're connected in what ways there is a thing called God or truth or love or oneness. And what is that? What is that in a human being and how can it be experienced? And literally throughout history there have been teachers and masters and goddesses and shamans and brahmin and all different types, all different colors of people who come into their human body and somehow have had an experience. And they say, you know, love is the answer. The true love, unconditional love. And then it's how do we get into that place and how do we get into that place and maintain it? And how do we get into that place and have the momentum in our lives propel us more and more to have that experience, to know, in fact, that the Father and I are one and everybody and I are one. That there is no other that there is a oneness, there is an energy in this universe that is, feels like love in a human body. And if we're experiencing that, our activities and our manifestations in this life are love in motion. And that's really what we want, and that's how we can experience the joy and the love, is to come into the experience that we are one. And I, in this human body, with whoever it says on that birth certificate, but from whatever country, is the oneness. We are all the oneness. And to some people that sounds, well, what does that mean? But interestingly enough, it doesn't compute in the head. It computes in the heart. It computes in the being. So how do we drop again into the being of that knowingness, into the being of truth, into the being of love? And there are many, many paths and many, many teachers. And there are different paths and different teachers because there are many, many extraordinary human flowers on this planet. But the thing is they have to work. They have to bring us into the heart. And if you're not having that experience, then, then the answer is to, to be in prayer for that. To be in prayer to know who you really are. To, to know that you are the oneness. You are the love no less than any of the great teachers and masters and the Jesus and Krishnas and Buddhas and, you know, all of them. All of them are you. And now is the time for that. And we're seeing so many people rise up more and more with that experience, more and more feeling that connection, feeling that love, feeling that oneness and wanting to share it. I mean, literally, if we had the the facilities to do it and, you know, the crew that was being paid and wouldn't have to do other jobs. And we could literally do hundreds and hundreds of shows every year with extraordinary people who are having that experience and want to share it. And maybe that'll happen soon. But for right now, 
it is available to you as you hear this, whenever, in whatever way you hear this, on television, on the internet, through a satellite, through on your iPod. It is available when you're watching it now for you to know truth. Have that prayer, have that experience, and it is there. And tonight's guest, that is her intention, that is her commitment, that is her dedication. Karen Colgan's a spiritual teacher, she's the author of an extraordinary new book, Ancient Pact, and this is volume one, and there are going to be many more. And her goal is to accelerate karma globally and reunite the ancient tribe of guardians and to renew the guardians' pact. And Really, when you hear her talk about it and you read the book about it, you will see that that is her spoke on the wheel to connect to that love and that oneness. And it's an extraordinary spoke, as all the spokes are extraordinary, because it's not the spokes that are the thing, it's to connect to the love and the oneness. And as most of you know, we do now, and on Bridging, on every show, we show art from all over the world that are part of the International Bridging Heaven and Earth Healing Art Project that came as a vision, that came as a dream, to send out a calling, a call to collaborate, a call for creativity, a call to play and work together by anybody who wants to, to create a new original piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth, and pieces and manifestations and sculptures and jewelry and all different formats of art and all different sizes have been common. And two of the pieces created tonight for that project were by Karen. And they're extraordinary. And you'll see, you know, here's, you know, a spiritual teacher and author, but she's also an artist because there's no limit. There is no limit to our capacity. There's no limit to our creativity. And we have two beautiful videos. One is a, a, a feminine mysticism in the arts, uh, with the arts video by uh, Victoria Christian, who's another person who's part of the art project. And we have a live music video uh, from uh, Gemini Sun Records that they sent us. It's, you know, we picked out a beautiful flute piece. So really this next 50, 45, 55 minutes, as every minute, is, it's an opportunity for us to connect, to be in creativity, to be in collaboration, and to recognize who and what we are. So join me in a short meditation, and we'll have the first beautiful video. We'll have Karen, we'll have art, and we'll just have an opportunity. So please join me in a meditation. Thank you. So this is a beautiful first video. You can see it by Victoria Christian. Uh, Victoria Christian. It's from a DVD, Feminine Mysticism with Art, and it just shows all these incredible, powerful, amazing images created with beautiful music behind it. And we picked, you know, one different section. Uh, it's a beautiful music, beautiful art. And again, it's, it's to inspire, it's to empower, it's to bring us into that vibration. So just watch it and settle in. And, you know, Victoria, I know, put a lot of time and energy and intention to make it a real piece of inspiration and, and wonder. So enjoy.
Hi everybody, welcome back. So that was a beautiful video, wasn't it? Really beautiful art. And three of the people who were shown there are people who were involved in the art project. Victoria Self, Victoria Christian, uh, Galen Larrick, whose piece you saw in there was a uh, the piece she did, Ele Elemental Alchemy, that she did for the Bridging Art Project that we have the original here that we've shown on the show. And the other one was Daniel Holman. So it's just spreading all over the world. And the piece you see in between us now is a piece Karen did. Welcome, Karen. Hi. <laughs> I knew I'd get around to that. And Karen did this amazing piece. Why don't you, what, how did this come through you? What inspired you? Well, that originally was a color pencil. When I travel, I can't take my paints with me. So I had taken my color pencils, and it was after meditation. It was just one of those things where when you get in that really great space during a meditation, you just kind of feel like I do, like I'm in a bubble. And so this was about the world around me being kind of crazy sometimes, but when I'm in meditation, oh, wow. it's very calming. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, so it was a uh, color pencil first, and then I made it an oil painting. Beautiful. So, I know that one of the real main thrusts now is, you know, your series of books and, you know, Ancient Pact Volume 1. Why don't you talk about how that came to be and what you wanted to do and, you know, the ancient pacts and the ancient, you know, that you'd like to bring back and the way of living and all that. That's a really big question, but... We have a really big hour. Okay, so you go, girl. All right. Well, I'll just start from the beginning then, and that is... Uh, as I was growing up, I was raised Catholic, and a lot of what I was taught really didn't make sense to me because I just felt like there was something else that they weren't telling us, or something I felt bigger than what they made me think I was. And so I spent a lot of time in my adult life trying to find where do I fit in in the spiritual realm. I looked at the different religions, and there were bits and pieces of different things that I liked. And so in 1989, I was on a trip to Asia, and a girlfriend that had been reading this book by Stuart Wilde, and it was called Affirmations, and she let me read it when she was finished, and that was my first idea that there were other people that thought like I did, because wow. I had, I just really... You I, were in a bubble. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it was wow, crazy. Wow, that's interesting. How old were you then? Um, huh, I was in my 20s. Wow, interesting. But, Where then, did you grow up? Illinois, mm -hmm. on a farm. Maybe. Yeah, that, you know, I mean, you know, maybe in terms of isolation yes. from certain ideas. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how our lives unfold. Absolutely. Yeah. And then um, I went to college, became an accountant, uh, became a CPA, and was really feeling like that was not who I was. And I was having some difficulty at work because I really did not enjoy mm -hmm. my life. I know I was really unhappy, but I was making good money. And so, you know, still part of that American dream, you know, go out, get a really great education, get a great job, make a lot of money. But I was not happy. I was having ulcers and headaches and really in disharmony with my environment. And I was, it was the 13th of February, I was on my way out to meet my now former boyfriend and a couple of friends for dinner. And I encountered a, a construction zone. And I talk about this in the book. I wrote the book as fiction, but this really did happen. I encountered a construction zone. You know how you have to hit the brakes because you're switching lanes. And there, I was in the slow lane, and the car next to me in the fast lane, they, they must have had bad brakes because there was this very high-pitched squeak sound, a squeal sound. And in that instant, I was no longer sitting in my car. Now, this is something I'd never heard anybody ex experience. This was, I mean, it was completely foreign to me. But I was no longer sitting in my, in my car, but actually I was experiencing myself standing in a valley with mountains on both sides, and there was a cave partway up the mountain, and I knew there were three ca caves up there, and I knew I was in danger. And I looked down, and there was a small girl next to me. She had long black hair, and she was looking at me in, in a scared way. Next thing I know, uh, these men came out of, the behind the shrubs and rocks, and they actually started hatcheting us up. And I experienced the death. I experienced watching my child die. And then the next thing I know, I'm back in my car, and I've driven a, probably a football field length through this construction zone with absolutely no memory of it. And it really shook me up because that was not part of my rational, logical experience. I like math. I like 
assets minus liabilities equal equity. I mean, I've, yeah, just, right, you know, right, so yeah, I like up, that. Right. And I, I, but I wanted the it's spirituality. Knowable. Yes, right. I understood that. And I, I was exploring spirituality, but I'd never... So you never exploded into... No, I'd never had anything like this, and nobody I knew had experienced anything like this. So I pulled off on the side of the road and had a little, you know, mini emotional episode, continued on to my boyfriend's house, and he told me not to tell anybody, because he, I guess, thought I was, I was under stress at work and all this stuff was going on, and he just said, don't tell anybody. Well, I, we walked into the restaurant, and my friend said, what's wrong? And I said, oh, no, nothing. It's just a bad day. No, it's not what happened. And I told them, and one of the women said, seems like you've either experienced a, she was Hopi, and she said, it seems to me like you may have experienced a portal into a different dimension, or maybe it's a past life, but something happened, because you're one of the most logical people I know. And I said, well, I don't know what to do with it, so I didn't think about it for a long time. But many years later, and after some counseling, I really put together that I know we don't die. Whatever that was, whether it's that my spirit was experiencing a different realm, different dimension, or whether it's a past life, whether things are happening concurrently, I, I don't really have a concrete answer, but I know that I'm not this body. I know that I am much more than this physical body, and I know we all are. And that's one of the messages I really want people to understand. That even if you don't experience something like this, we are not this body. This is just a do suit that we walk around in. It's a remote control unit for the spirit. And we're bigger than this. And I experienced that. And I also saw how experiencing something like that in this vision has infected this lifetime. I was always afraid to have children because I was afraid they'd die. Well, duh, it makes sense once I see that. And I don't know whether that's past life memory or some bleed through, but it starts to make sense on how other things that are happening in that bigger reality can influence this lifetime. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a piece of what I'm wanting to accomplish. And so how did that develop into that this, this, these volumes start, are going to start coming through me and, and they're all going to be chock full of basic wisdom and information that and vibration that will bring about more of that knowing on this planet. And well, what I, what I also got out of that was I did lots of meditations and past life regressions. I did some, a workshop with Brian Wise, who's really well known in, in reincarnation and regression kind of thing. And I really got a, more clarity on who these people were and why they were murdered. And that became the story of Ancient Pact, which is my concept is that when, or what I'm, understanding happened is that when we first incarnated, we remembered what we were. We knew we were spirit beings. We knew that this was a remote control unit that we're here to experience this realm. And that I think it happened all over the world, that people wanted to remember that and also pass it on to their progeny and their future generations. Remember what you are. Remember that you are this thing, this, this bigger thing than what you think you are. And so they made a pact. They were intending to make a pact to help create that and energetically and spiritually and ground it. Because the, the, the thing is with the physical body, I think it's got a mind of its own. And so it, it protects us and, and it wants to survive. And so it's up to the spirit self, soul, whatever you want to call it, to understand that the, this body wants to protect itself, and there's ego because involved. it has something to do with knowing it's not infinite. Right. The physical body in its form. It knows it's not, but it's going to do its best to protect us, and that's where ego comes from, that's where pattern behaviors come from, that's where addictions come from, because this, this body wants to protect itself, but the spirit itself kind of in this unknowing state that it's, that it's got this remote control re unit, and it needs to take the control unit back from the physical body and say, wait a minute, I'm here to experience this life to enjoy it, to experience this realm in a way that I couldn't do without the body. And so instead of letting the body control and the mind of the body controlling our existence, it's up to the soul to say, wait a minute, I'm not a body with a soul. I'm a soul with a body. And I'm going to take control now and, and meditate or whatever, yoga, tai chi, whatever it is, that mechanism that helps the person connect with that, that consciousness that really is the driving force behind the body. 
And so that's part of what my message is. And so I remember at the opening I was talking about, you know, to bring that knowledge in and to, to bring a, a remembrance of the ancient past. Yes. And, and so why don't you talk a little bit? Well, oh, part of the story is that these people knew this and they were murdered in that lifetime. And of course, anytime we experience trauma or suffering, there is, um, if you're not really conscious or wanting to stay conscious, that becomes sort of a pattern or a an ego kind of response because, of course, when, if you do believe in reincarnation, you come back, you've got a little bit of a scar there. And if you're not addressing it in lifetime after lifetime, you're building up layers, I think, of trauma, suffering, and that affects our ability to be the big being that we really are, the big spirit being. We kind of get grounded into the body. And one of the things we also do is the language. It's really important to be conscious of what we say, think, and do. And a lot of our language keeps us grounded in the body. When I die. Well, it's not when I die. It's when the body dies. When I get sick. Well, I don't get sick. The body gets sick. And so we say a lot of things that really keep us thinking the body's in control. The body's the one that, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, um, it's really incumbent upon us to get that consciousness. And part of the pact would be, a, remem a remembrance that in the community and individually we've got a uh, reminding each other that we have an awareness that is bigger than what we think it is. And so, I mean, you had your spiritual practices to, or, or practices now to bring that remembrance, to become one with that remembrance, so we don't get pulled into the, uh, the negativity and the drama that this body, in a way, feeds on. Right. So, I mean, how would you recommend to people that if they believe in that pact, if they somehow in them remember, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's, I made that, or it just feels right to them, let's say that, how, how would they take steps to make that real for them and, and build up the momentum of that in their life? I really think a huge component of that is the community, finding the people who will support that, um, growth in you. There's a there's a lot there's a lot of um, talk around um, supporting one another, but there um, it really takes conscious action and support of one another. Where no matter what that person does, you're celebrating their successes, and not the jealous thing. But, you know, when somebody's having a great day, congratulate them, be excited. But it's it's really um, about validating that person's experience, but also having the community that encourages you to remember that you're bigger than that. That sometimes one of the lessons in ancient pact is that perception is a reality is greater than perception. And a lot of times we get stuck in perceiving a very limited ability for ourselves and other people. And the community can help you say, well, wait a minute, do you really want to say I'm having a bad day? Because you're just creating a bad day. Do you want to change that? How do you want to change it? And a friend, community, and help you do that. So I think one of the most important things is to have a support system of people who will encourage you to continue growing, growing and celebrate your successes with you and hold up the mirror when you're in that negative space and creating negative uh, vibrations, negative realities for yourself because the reality is much bigger than that day. And so, I mean, do you see that as... Uh you know, living communities, or see, you know, I see as part of like new paradigms that these communities are almost uh, in cyberspace. You know what I mean? Like on a Facebook, you could be part of, or MySpace, or you know, or phone I mean, call. All of them, yeah. yeah, in a way, because you know, we know since bridging's all bridging shows are on Google and YouTube, uh, you know, Google Video and YouTube. I mean, we get emails and calls from literally, and people become subscribers to Bridging, so every time a new show comes out, they, they uh, see it uh, or get notified of it. That it's almost like all the, the walls and all the, you know, the pact that is opening up to the world in a way, instantaneously. Yeah, and I think that's fabulous. It's wonderful. And one of the women in, in the story, the false, the, we never really meet the, the real fire tribe, the group that represents the element of fire because they were destroyed first. And so there's a false fire tribe that comes in and they're the ones that are operating from greed 
and trying to have power and dominate others, which we see a lot of that at play right now. And one of the women relates to the, the, the concept of the fire tribe that was destroyed. And so, I mean, she's really active in creating a fire tribe. And I just think that's wonderful because she's developing this wonderful support system to help her and the people in, the, in her group become a, uh, more connected and empowered in what they're doing. And, and what would this fire tribe, what would be their, like, mission statement? Their mission statement is that fire is a cleansing. It's, a, it's an opportunity to look, it's kind of like a transformative energy that it, it cleans up the old seeds, the weed seeds, and creates a space for the new things to flower that are more um, conscious and the things that they want to plant and create. And so would there be a tribe of every element? Is that the theory? I think there are multiple tribes of, every, of all the elements. And so, yeah, whoever, whatever resonates with them, whatever element, or maybe it's multiple elements, but whatever that resonates to them, then maybe interpreting those elements into their lives. Wind being, things being more, uh, manifesting dreams, taking what's not real now and making it real. And water being the, another form of cleansing and movement and going with the flow and being flexible and open to change. And earth, of course, being very grounded and a necessary part of us for not being too much in the air element and being really grounded in what we're doing and conscious, taking steps that make sense. And, and so, I mean, we'll talk about it in the second half after the video, but it seems to me that we'll also at this time as these new paradigms that in essence all the, the four elements or all the four directions are becoming into one direction, the direction of love, the direction of oneness. So, you know, people are more in a sense well-rounded. You know, they, you know what I mean? They're more balanced, they're more harmonious, they're more uh, neutral in that particular way. So they're available for everything, they're just like a real clean vehicle. Absolutely. And the elements are only one way of communicating the, the characteristics of the same thing, of re reuniting to that oneness and the guardianship that we're not here to exploit, but rather to nurture and take care of one another and the planet and being conscious of that oneness. You know, it's interesting because I know one of the things I really saw in your book was the guardianship. Maybe we'll talk really about that in a second. I think that would be really interesting to people. And really. Okay, so now we're going to see the second beautiful, it's a beautiful music video. It's this incredible flutist, flautist. <laughs> I get it wrong every time. Uh, Nicholas Gunn, he's a really incredible player. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just a beautiful video sent to us by Gemini Sun Records. Uh, from their live uh, music video, uh, Nicholas Gunn. Uh, you know, it's just a beautiful piece, so enjoy.
Yeah, thank you, Gemini Music, for sending Gemini Records for sending that beautiful video. We really appreciate it. And so the picture you're seeing in between us that Karen did for the art project, she did two pieces, is Infinite Affinity. So why don't you talk about that a little? Well, this was created um, out of a meditation as well. I painted while singing to uh, Krishna Das's Kirtans, but its basis is the infinity sign, and then it's all around. It can be interpreted as soulmates that connect and or different aspects of the same self, but it also has, in keeping with the ancient text, the four elements depicted in the picture. So there's a lot going yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, your colors are great. I mean, yeah. I saw, when you sent the JPEG originally, it's like, oh, baby, these are beautiful. I have action, action colors. Yeah, really <laughs> powerful colors. So why don't you talk a little about the Guardian and what we're here to do and what our kind of our goal and our destiny is. Why don't you talk about that? I really believe that we and our spirit self know that we came here to experience this realm in a way that we manage the resources and enjoy the resources, but we're not taking advantage and taking without consciousness. I think the Native Americans really had a very good and clear understanding of what their role was, and that is to respect it. When they killed an animal, most of the tribes that I'm familiar with, they, they thank the animal for their flesh, and they even offer, before they take their first bite, at least the Native Americans that I've known, they even offer the first bite to the earth to say thank you for what's happened. They prayed to the spirits of the wind and the air and the earth and the rocks. And they really were connected with the spiritual, the, the essence, the oneness of the planet and their experience. And I really think the dominant culture in our existing country, for example, could really do more to appreciate that and act as guardians instead of just taking without appreciation and respect but and part of the guardianship I don't think Mother Earth needs our protection as much as what I'm saying is having that stewardship uh, not only for the planet but with each other and I, I really believe if we knew the oneness if we experienced the oneness and lived it we really couldn't do the things that we do to one another with war and the, the crimes we commit against one another or even just something as simple as talking about someone behind their back those things that we do that really undermine that oneness, the, our ability to connect with ourselves and other people. And, and what do you think in our evolution created that separation and, and again, repeat how, how we can come back into that? I think it's really important to, you know, to, for people to really understand you know, the nature of connecting, the nature, and how important it is to connect, and, Literally, the tools needed to do that. Yeah, and I, I think what you're what you're asking is a really important question because it's one thing to have a dialogue and an intellectual discourse around the concepts, which are wonderful and great. But a lot of people, myself included, are really more logical and rational. And I need practical steps. I need something that is tangible to help me get to that point. I. I, it's hard for a lot of people to go from, especially when they've been raised with a lot of dogma and a lot of misinformation around their religion, it's really hard to step out of that and say, okay, I understand what you're saying. I understand being guardian. I understand oneness, but how do I get from where I am to where you want me to be? And, and it's, it's not something that would be really easy to answer in 15 minutes. But what, I'm, what I would say is it's I really believe it's, real, it's very important to be conscious of our thoughts, words, and actions. That where your thoughts go is where so much of your energy goes. And I have found for myself that when I am really paying attention to my thoughts and, and trying to get to that quiet space, that's where my power is. For example, I remember that years ago when I took one of my first meditation classes, the instructor taught us to label things as we saw it. So that was part of our meditation. I see a tree. I see a bird. To label it. But there's, a, there's some power in that because you become aware of your thoughts. But the problem is we never went beyond that to that quiet place. And I even was paying attention this morning as I was walking my dog at 4 o'clock in the morning. There were some birds just starting to sing. And I thought, oh, birds are singing. Huh. No. Just listen to the birds without talking about it in my head. And so... For me, part of that 
equation on getting to that place is having that quiet space in my mind where I'm not thinking, where I'm not talking to myself. And I've even had some, I taught some classes where we had some meditation as part of it. People said, oh, my, I don't talk in my head. I'm, I have a very quiet mind. But yet they're sitting there, you know, doing all kinds of things. Yeah, and, and they're and constantly they're judging. Just, and right, and they're doing all kinds of stuff. And it's like, but what is going on inside your head? And it's, a lot of people aren't really trained to think about what's going on in their head. So they're just on automatic pilot moving forward. And so part of that equation is to step back and say, what is going on internally? Am I doing a lot of talking? And what's that talking saying? Is it saying, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not handsome enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not, I'm not making enough money? Well, wouldn't you say that if, if it's talking at all, it's going to say, you know, both sides of the coin? Look how nice you are and look how unnice. You know what I mean? That's the nature of mind. It'll get you one way or another. Yeah. And so the, the trick is to be able to be conscious enough. And I really think that that's part of what consciousness is, is to really be able to step back and say, am I in control of what's going on in my life or is my life, my body's mind controlling me? Am I an automatic pilot? Am I speaking in cliches and not really thinking about what I'm saying? Or am I really stepping back and saying, what is it I want out of this experience? Do I want to say what I need to say and make make my message clear, or am I just going to say something that's memorized and that I've spent hours preparing? And so it's and we're going through life that way. And so it's really about stepping back and saying, what do I want this life to look like, and how am I going to experience it, and translate that to something that makes sense, both in, all in thoughts, words, and in actions. And, and do you find that? Uh, I mean, you know, throughout history, they, they've talked about different ways of spiritual paths, but, you know, certain ways of be here now, to be in the moment. So you're saying that, that the mental activity takes you out of where life is, which is in this moment. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. That's much nice to, to, to think. Oh, try to say that fast. The succinct way of saying it, yes. And it is about being in the moment. And when you're eating an apple or one of those delicious peaches someone brought tonight, really enjoying the peach and, and savoring it as it dribbles down your chin or that your teeth just knock against the pit. It's like, oh, isn't that interesting? But not thinking about it, just experiencing it and not judging it. And, and that's really such an important part of experience. It's not judging my own experience or someone else's. It's just, oh, that is what is. And, and your way, or one of the ways that you've used in your life to break the momentum, the pattern of uh, assets and liabilities and judgment and, you know, and, and religion and countries and all your identification that were limiting because, as we talked about before, I don't, maybe it was even at the break, about whatever you think you are, you're more. So all those things that we think about end up limiting us. Absolutely. So, and you use at some point meditation. What other tools have you used? And do, do you find that any type of meditation that brings you into that quiet place is a value? Want to talk about that a little? I think everybody's formula is going to be different. Um, I can only speak to what works for me. And meditation, absolutely. And sometimes it's guided. I guide myself. And sometimes it's with the tape. Sometimes it's just getting quiet and just being one of the most magical things that ever happened to me was when I, I mean I've had it happen many times now but the first time it happened was I was on a beach in a foreign country in Bali and I the sunset was beautiful and I, it was before I actually started this path and it was an accident sort of I guess you call it an accident it's not, I don't really believe in accidents right. but it was just happened that I was enjoying the sunset I wasn't talking my, my mind wasn't talking and I was just thinking how beautiful it was I could feel the sand in between my toes. The water was lapping on my ankles. People were holding hands on the beach. I was thinking how beautiful that was, and they obviously were in love, and somebody else was massaging someone on the beach. I was like, all of a sudden, it was like, boom, I just felt this. I, I just felt the expansiveness. I just, I wasn't chattering. I was just noticing these things, the details, feeling and experiencing with all my levels. And I even felt like I knew what animals were in the, under the water. And it was just this wonderful thing. And, of course, as soon as I said, oh, I want to feel this way forever, but of course it was gone because I was trying to grab onto it. But for me, being in nature is one of the best ways to really connect with that. And just being aware of what I'm thinking and walking in nature or sitting by a stream or 
something that makes that person feel in the moment, playing with their dog, a, a, ch- a child, something that makes them really pay attention. Some people rock climb, jump out of airplanes. Those kinds of things tend to rivet the attention on that activity and being in the now. I mean, if you don't pull the ripcord, it's not going to happen for long anyway. Right, you'll be in the now for a <laughs> few more. Right, yeah. and then the now is it's going to change for yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the whole, but doing things that really get you into that moment, something that makes you feel love, being with someone you love. I think those are the kinds of things that will help. And being conscious about it, not just doing it, but being conscious about what you're doing. And so you would say that, that in a way that like opens the door. And like throughout history, they talked about gurus or teachers that kind of open the door or their frame is, you know, the viewpoint into the infinite. Right. And then you want to walk into the infinite and then you don't have a guru anymore. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be at the beach. I mean, would you agree that, you know, sometimes what we end up doing is, I feel this way at the beach, so you got to, you know, be at the beach all the time and not realize that that's an experience you could have right. in the middle of Manhattan, you know, uh, all over. I mean, in your home, on the, you know, line at the supermarket. Exactly. The second time it happened, I, again, totally unexpected. I wasn't thinking about trying to recapture that. I was with friends at a uh, Cubs and Cardinals baseball game. And my One friends, of the known spiritual <laughs> I know. I mean, it's like it's totally, fantastic totally not where you'd think this would happen. So they're, my friends are having a chat over here, and I'm just sitting there, you know, just enjoying all the people. I mean, it was packed because Cubs and Cards are yeah, you know, major rivals. rivals. And so I was just looking, and all of a sudden, it's like, mm, I just felt that it's like a hum. It's like it's kind of like when the wind's behind you on the on the highway and you just kind of feel like you're just being carried along and it's just this lovely floaty feeling that's kind of what it, I don't know how to explain it but that's what it felt like I said ah I want to hang on to it boom it's gone again you know as soon as I try to grab it so now what happens I just try to just enjoy it and not have any thoughts about it and just be glad it's happened be grateful I always try to say and do you see that building up a momentum in you that you know it's more true it's more true it's more real it's been you know more of your time more of your dedication I mean I talk about it as it's like rubbing up against the magnet you know the more you have the experience of the infinite the oneness the love you know the vastness then the more you have it you realize oh I'm that magnet and the rest of the things I'm not you know what it says, I'm not a CPA, although I am a CPA and all I am or what it says, but that's so small in comparison to this vast thing. It's just a little facet on the diamond, you know, it's just a little aspect of it. And it's not really who I am anyway. It's just something I've done. That And that's really, I think, where a lot of people get stuck is they define themselves by their experience when, in fact, that's only what you've experienced. It's not who you are. And right. And so, you you call this ancient pact volume one. So I mean, when you were given the vision or the, the you know the, the uh, force to, to come out and do this and the destiny to do this, I mean, was it given that you're going to do four or eight or ten or just this is volume one? Call it volume one, and who knows? My plan is to do at least four, um, but who knows? It could go on. I don't know. I'm yeah. just sort of. Um, but the, the the initial energy was that you were going to do four of these. Yes. Right? At least, actually five, but I haven't figured out how that's going to work, and I'm not going to worry about it because I found yeah, that when I sit more. down, right. when, when I sit down, it just comes out differently than what I expect, so I'm not going to put any parameters on it. Yeah, and it. yeah exactly, limitations. Right. I mean, you know, it's interesting, but it, it always it is just interesting to me how we limit ourselves and how, you know, in this incredible, you know, I talk about it's hurtling through space in a ball. I mean, everything about this human condition, this human experience is is like a miracle. It's unreasonable. You know, everything about it, and yet we try to bring reason to it to bring us parameters in this vastness. And it's almost like we're afraid to experience the vastness, but once you experience the vastness, it's the most beautiful thing. I mean, that's the interesting part. You know, the dilemma of the human condition, kind of. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And we're raised to believe in this sort of limited view. And I think it's because, well, I think a lot of that was used as a way to manipulate and control people, was to make them think that they're smaller than they are. Because, of course, if you knew 
that you were spirit in this remote control body, you might behave differently than if you thought. Yeah, you wouldn't be intimidated by no. anything. No. Like, what could somebody do? Take this body? Yeah. Go. Go so, for it. Yeah, whatever. Because yeah. I'll just come back here or whatever you want to do in the next life. Oh, whatever you want to do after this body is no longer useful. But I think there's a lot of reasons why we were given those limited perceptions of ourselves. And that's part of what I guess our lesson is, is uh, karma, whatever you want to call it, is to really regain your power, claim it back. Renew the pact, whatever you want to call it, whatever spoke in the will you're talking about, whatever method works for you, see if that works for you to, to take do something that gets you out of that Limitate, limitating, limit, limitation thinking. You know, and actually, I think that that's really a lot of what you know the message is. You know, more and more people are, are just rising up and saying, "I am more. I am infinite. I am. I am love. I am. You know, the goddess and I are one. The father and I are one. And that's why it's such an extraordinary time with all this uh, craziness and all this the fear levels rising and prices rising and people losing their homes is that the counterweight of all this incredible love just sparkling all over the planet. And I think it's lovely that so many different people are saying the same thing, but they're saying it a different way. And so my way may not work for somebody, but somebody else's, your way might work for somebody. So we're, we're catching those people in different ways that maybe wouldn't have been. Right. And, that, you know, we've talked about it on the show. It's like we've had so many shows, and they're all, all the different spokes on the wheel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just to reach the center, to reach the heart, to reach the oneness, to reach the love. You know, that's beautiful. Okay. So, really, I mean, I'm really glad you came. I really thank you for this you. incredible art. And, you know, it's an opportunity. So, we're coming to the end again. If you want any information on Karen, the book. Uh, you know, she's, she does workshops and everything. Alan, 805-687-2053. 805-687-2053. If you want to join us in the art project, please do. Uh, Heaven to Earth Art. Good night. God bless you. We love you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.